that is spread across several time zones. Uh, welcome to this uh, Harasses Asia meeting and our panel on aspiring to the SDG goals. I have the privilege of moderating this panel. My name is Lou Marinoff, Professor of Philosophy and Asian Studies at the City College of New York. I'm going to be very brief because we have a wonderful panel and I want to give them every opportunity to enlighten us with their views. Uh, Frank's uh, team uh, at Horasis has set us a very good challenge. Uh, we are asked actually uh, to do some complicated answering of questions, and I'm going to do it in three rounds with the panel. So without further ado, uh, let me pose the first question to the panel, and then I'll call upon them uh, one by one to give their uh, three-minute answer. Question one is, how can we ensure Asian governments and businesses uh, devise ways to achieve the SDGs with a good outcome for the planet and humankind while also suppressing COVID? A rather utopian question. So please, uh, firstly, we'll call on Michael Yeo, President of KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific based in Malaysia. Welcome, Michael, and, and please, uh, please give us your response to the first question. Thank you very much, Lou. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Delighted to be speaking once again at the Horasis Asia Summit. I think this year is a year of living dangerously because we are faced with the critical crisis of health and livelihood. And as the Chinese character uh, for crisis, Wei Ji denotes uh, two characters, danger and opportunity, I think we are faced in this world more dangers and opportunity arising from the pandemic. I think this gives us a good opportunity to reset relations between governments, business, and civil society. I think one way for Asia Pacific to achieve the SDGs is to further promote and build on tripartite partnerships between government, business, and civil society. And very often the civil society that I mentioned has been left out. And I think we need to include civil society. I think it is also worthwhile to recognize that in the recent report, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific, ASCAP, has concluded that by the year 2030, which is the target year for achievement of SDGs, there's no one country in Asia Pacific that can achieve all of the 17 SDGs. And I think this is a huge, big issue that we need to address. And the one biggest challenge is the lack of financing. It has been estimated that there are trillions of dollars that needs to be put into the funding of all of the 17 SDGs. And here there is a huge shortfall in terms of providing public financing for SDGs. So we need to scale up public financing. And I think this is where public-private partnership comes in. This is where we need to be thinking of creating sustainable bonds or green bonds, floating green bonds in the market that will help raise uh, financing capacity of the different countries. I think what's important also for the Asia Pacific country to look at is to prioritize some of the key outcomes that we want in the SDGs. And I think one of these is SDG 10, which is reducing inequalities. We need to all work harder to ensure that together government, business and civil society can reduce inequalities throughout the Asia Pacific region. The, third, the second very big challenge that governments and business face in the region here is action on climate change, SDG 17, focusing on climate change and climate action. A lot needs to be done in this area. And I think we need to get together the best scientists, the best entrepreneurs, the best financiers, the best people, activists in civil society to be able to work together to achieve a new green world, or as some in the U.S. call it now, the new Green Deal. I think that the road forward towards decarbonization of countries and societies is a key challenge that we need to be focusing on. Here in Asia Pacific, I think we're also looking at creating the green and blue economy. It's not just a green economy, mm -hmm. but for us, the blue economy is equally important. Blue economy basically encompasses the two oceans that straddles our region. 
the Indian Ocean on the one end, Pacific Ocean on the other. And with a focus on the blue economy, we need to also look at life underwater, which is another of the very important challenge in the SDGs. So we need to be able to recognize these are important priorities, to look at climate change initiatives during the recovery phase and, and the recovery plans of governments. The, the action on climate change needs to be emphasized, needs to be addressed, and we need to also get the business community on board to embrace uh, climate change. We need to also focus on digital competitiveness, on the continued the, the digitalization of both the global and regional economy. And I think this is something that both business and government can work together to ensure digital transformation of our countries and of our companies. We need to see new opportunities in the digital economy. We need to be able to look at restructuring of the global value chain that will take into account digital technology so that we are all better prepared to ensure the sustenance of the global supply chain. I think that's probably my introduction. Well, Thank that's you. a very weighty uh, and ponderous introduction. You've given us a lot of food for thought. Thank you very much, Michael. And without further ado, uh, I'm going again in reverse alphabetical order tonight. Our next speaker is Nat Wong, co-founder of the Happy Turtle Straw in Switzerland. It's the middle of the night, Nat, I think, in Switzerland. Could you please uh, carry on with your response to this question? How can we ensure Asian governments and businesses devise ways to achieve the SDG? Please tell us your thoughts on this. And also, we were, we're looking for a globally good outcome and at the same time needing to suppress COVID. Uh, please, Nat, over to you. Thanks, Lou. Hi, everyone. I, I hope you uh, you hear me well because I keep on receiving the message but that my connection is not stable. <laughs> so, we hear uh, you. Anyway, uh, we'll have to do with what we have. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit early, I have to say, yeah. <clears throat> it's 3.30 a.m. in Switzerland right now, so I might go back to bed after this, <laughs> this session. But uh, it's nice to be here and uh, share with you. So I want to tell a bit uh, my point of view, which is from a, a Swiss startup uh, that strives to contribute to the to SDGs. So um, basically, we have uh, I have a startup uh, called the Happy Toto Straw, as you as you heard from Lou, and um, it's a very simple product. It's basically uh, some straws that are made of potatoes and cassava. Um, and uh, it was inspired by this turtle that that got was found with a plastic straw in its nose. Uh, it's a video that became viral and, and shocked uh, millions of people around the world. Um, and that uh, motivated me to to contribute to reduce plastic pollution. Um, so what we have created is a is a very uh, simple object. It's just something you would use every day. It's a, tro a straw. Uh, but the, the difference with, with plastic straw or paper straw is that actually this one, you can eat it. So it doesn't harm the environment anymore. Um, and we're really proud of this um, innovation. And I'm sorry for the noise. <laughs> it's pretty good, actually. Um, uh, we, we, we are proud to contribute to, to some SDGs, SDGs number 12, uh, with the responsible production, uh, 13, 14 and also 15 uh, for to rise <clears throat> the, the life below water and um, for the life on land. Uh, a lot of animals are currently being uh, victims of, of plastic pollution, not only the turtles, but, but any type of animals. Uh, even the planktons are eating microplastic that, uh, you know, they compose from the plastic that are found in the ocean. So we need to find a way to get out of plastic. And for us, uh, the, the, the government uh, is very important uh, for us because they will contribute to the legislation to prohibit single-use plastic. In Switzerland, uh, we're still very much behind Europe, um, even though some cities like Geneva have, have, have flat, uh, sorry, prohibited single-use plastic, but it's not uh, like in all the, 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 the cities in Switzerland. But the European Union from January, it's just one month away, uh, we'll start prohibiting single-use plastic, including um, straws, uh, cutleries, uh, etc. So 
what I would like to encourage for, for the future is, is more collaboration between government by giving grants to startups like us who, who strive to, uh, from the public sector, uh, contribute to, to the SDGs and get maybe a, a more, um, I would say, you know, like um, incubation startup for, for com like startup that contributes to the SDGs. I think that's something that should be put uh, forward on the map. Um, we are developing, um, I have to say during the COVID, the show business was a bit impacted. So we had to develop uh, some new uh, products. So we are pretty proud to introduce for the first time in public, uh, some uh, actually cutleries, some forks and knives that are actually made of uh, rice and also after usage can be uh, safely eaten. Um, so um, innovation is really important. Innovation comes from startups. And I hope to encourage that more government contribute to startups, especially the one contributing to the SDGs. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. For this. And uh, when you uh, figure out how to clean up the great uh, uh, garbage plastic patches, please let us know about that too. I'm glad to hear you're no longer contributing to it. We have also banned single-use plastic in New York State, among other states. <laughs> but we need to get rid of what's there now as you well know. Uh, but thank you very much indeed for your contribution. And your your mention of startup segues to our next panelist, Jitesh Shetty, who is based uh, in Silicon Valley and uh, is the founder of Quick Labs, a subsidiary of Google. So uh, Jitesh, uh, please uh, give us your feedback on this question. We know you may not have all the answers, but you surely have all the data. So uh, kindly uh, tell us uh, what, what are your views <laughs> on how Asian governments and businesses can can achieve the SDGs and also bring about a rather globally good outcome and suppress COVID. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lou. I, I hope uh, you uh, guys can hear me okay because uh, it's really breaking in and out. Uh, can, you, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay, we hear okay. you well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So, so just uh, piggybacking on the last two panelists, right? Uh, I do believe uh, that the opportunity here is to really take up uh, uh, to bring tech to the forefront, right? And bring tech to the forefront in two specific areas. Uh, one area is around uh, what's uh, what's called data collection and statistics, right? Uh, and making that uh, really kind of tech driven. What within a uh, big organizations you call BI, uh, business intelligence, making that even uh, in in the government sector, how data is collected, moving from a very kind of manual paper driven way to to making that very tech driven way, and not just thinking about tech as a as an enabler, but thinking about tech as 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 very at the center uh, at the center of all this, right? Like building these processes and operations on how you collect data and how you make sense out of data uh, in, a, in a very kind of uh, core technology way, right? To give you an example is uh, if you're collecting data around like agriculture produce or around like uh, the healthcare safety, uh, how can you very quickly react and say that kind of, you know, uh, uh, really data on the ground, you're not able to collect it today because of COVID. Uh, can we build something uh, very quickly in a very iterative, in a very low cost, in a very agile format, and then deploy it? And I think uh, some of those programs have to partner with uh, technologists, either in a either within the pub public sector or with someone in the private sector. But it has to be really kind of hand in hand, right? It doesn't have to be that the technology provider is just a vendor it is it is part of the program it is core to the program it's almost like thinking you're running a, a very software tech driven program right so that's one 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 area where how you collect data how you make sense out of this data uh, view this kind of uh, black swan event as a blessing in disguise and take like a holistic view and say can we can we make this very tech driven data driven uh, uh, that piece, right? Almost like business intelligence, how big companies think about that. That's one. Uh, second, uh, goals like education, where you can uh, really uh, do the distribution of both, uh, of either the product or the service on a digital platform, 
I think uh, governments should really look at leveraging that, right? One of the things that's happening with education is the whole unbundling of education, right? Uh, where, you know, uh, really things you need to get a job that is getting unbundled from higher ed, right? If you, if you want like a certain brand and learn something from a specific software company, you can go and take that specific course on Coursera, for example. So there is a lot of unbundling happening in education. So uh, governments can look at how can we pick some specific bundles and uh, distribute that on, on a technology platform. This is a very unique time to, to really take a holistic view, but also, again, going back to the software example, uh, not be not take a very monolithic waterfall approach, but be very agile, be very iterative, uh, you know, and uh, around both building these programs, which are technology driven. And I consciously use the word technology driven and not technology enabled, right? Where this is really kind of driven by technology, overviewing technology as just a catalyst. And then distribute that and operate that in a very technology centric way. So I think this is an unfortunate event globally. It impacts uh, also uh, the, the impact is uh, to the on the marginal side, right? But how can we view uh, at this and say, you know, uh, uh, view this event and say uh, governments can say, can we uh, take a holistic view at some of our programs and really bring innovation to the forefront? Uh, especially software technology driven innovation okay jitesh I, I, uh, I would say those are those are the two areas right like yes jitesh i'm sorry you're over everyone's over time so we need to move on i very much appreciate your technology contribution and like everyone else i'm awed by the ways in which technologies have changed and shaped our world during the digital revolution i cannot however as a philosopher forbear from being a bit of a devil's advocate and asking you and your colleagues in Silicon Valley to consider not only data in which we're currently drowning, but also an interpretation of data. We have more than enough data on COVID, but I'm speaking now from my experience in the US. We do not have anything but politicization and curation of data on the big technology platforms. And it's possible, impossible even for well-educated scientific persons to make any sense out of the, the research. There's, a, there's an incredible lack of coherence of professional opinion. And this is very disturbing to us who are trying to cope with COVID. So, so kindly don't let go of the idea that data, raw data need to be interpreted at the end of the day and interpreted in an objective way, neither politicized nor curated. I'm sorry to, to make such an adamant response to you, but I think that has to counterbalance technological development or we should simply stop being human and turn everything over to the machines. That's a philosopher's view. And I'll give you a chance to respond after. Sean, uh, Sean Deverson, please uh, welcome to our panel. You're the director of Lighthouse Futures in Australia. Kindly tell us uh, your take on this uh, on this opening question. Well, thanks, Lou. I think you sort of stole my thunder there in terms of I was just going to add to the commentary in terms of the technological, technological certainly aspect of it. Um, I certainly agree with the panelists in terms of the, the ability to deploy technology to help resolve some of our problems, but it needs to come with and the backing of cultural and philosophical understanding. And, and the back of that is education. So the two need to be wedged hand in glove together. So uh, for me to answer the question in terms of how do we ensure we're deploying the SCGs that are, that are meaningful and purposeful and actually uh, contribute, that, that don't lead to consequences, that needs to be backed by education. So if I think that's I think what the, the Asia Pacific region needs to do yeah, it's one thing to deploy SDGs and backed by technology, but it's, it's taking that contextually rich approach to their regions and understanding which SDGs will work and what technology will work to actually resolve those issues. Um, from a top-down approach, Lou, just if, it, if I can just add, um, if, I can, if I can borrow an African proverb, and we've already mentioned it on this discussion and as well as many others, it's uh, taking that multilateral approach, and the proverb is uh, that many have heard is, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And I think the Asian Pacific region needs to take a very holistic approach, systemic approach to its uh, climate change and sustainability issues post COVID. I think, and from that perspective, I think what COVID has, um, if, if anything else, provide a salient example of how you can mesh both science 
and political decision making to actually come together and actually come to resolutions quickly. So it, it's actually debunked the whole, you know, I guess the, the, the issue that we've had in terms of sustainable development, now it's taken many decades to get here, we've still got problems, but what well, COVID's actually proven is that when we come together, problems actually can actually be resolved pretty quickly. So, and by those political um, leaders who actually embrace science in their political decision-making, it's, it's proven that they've come off better, better from those countries that have less so. So, um, no, you know, noting the time right now, that was just my two cents. But, um, yeah, I just want to just, again, just back up that, that emphasis of technology is great, but it needs to come with a, a fair bit of contextual and a philosophical understanding. Well, I can hardly disagree with that, uh, uh, Sean. But, I mean, clearly, so one of the SDGs that would be near the top of your priority list would be education, presumably. Yep. Given what you've just uh, 100%. Told. That's great. I only wish we had more time to develop these ideas coming from all of you. Last but not least this round, it's a privilege to introduce Ravi uh, Shitambaram, president and co-founder of TC Capital in Singapore. So Ravi, please, I know you have some thoughts on this matter too, so please share them with us. You know, thank you, Lou, and it's nice to be back at Horasis. Uh, so I think just adding on to what a lot of the panelists say since I'm speaking last, let me focus on the regulatory environment and capital markets, because I think that uh, in order for the SDGs to really take hold uh, in the Asia Pacific region in a meaningful way, um, I think we need to think about the regulatory aspect and the capital markets aspect. Let me start with the regulatory aspect. I think it would be a very good thing if more governments in the region required mandatory sustainability reporting uh, of companies large and small. Asian governments are beginning to do that. In fact, a number of listed companies on various stock exchanges like Singapore, Hong Kong, Jakarta, Bombay, now China, actually are required to submit sustainability reports. This is a good small first step, but I think the Asian government should also consider something like the EU taxonomy. Maybe that's something that could be rolled out, for example, within ASEAN, you know, which is a similar body. But as those of you familiar with the EU taxonomy will know, any company uh, that's a member of the EU with more than $20 million in revenue, public or private, will have to actually report in a far more detailed manner uh, on their sustainability undertakings. I think that disclosure is a first step towards meeting any of the SDGs. And I think the reality is the governments cannot do it with the cooperation of the business sector and reporting is the starting point. But reporting is not the ending point from a reg framework. The reality is many, many companies don't even understand what sustainability is, do not have a good grasp of what the SDGs are, why they should be achieved, uh, and so on. So I think more context needs to be provided uh, by governments around the reporting requirements. For example, there's a very interesting initiative going on between the Family Business Network, which is a huge network of large family-owned companies around the world and the United Nations to actually put together 33 KPIs, which are attached to the 17 SDGs, to actually define what it means to meet that SDG, how it's done, and how companies are performing on that. So it's a kind of measurement tool. And I think that this sort of tool also needs to be provided by governments to companies so they not only file sustainability reports, but that they file quality reports with meaning uh, that actually track KPIs attached to each SDG. And I think the corollary to good reporting is good capital markets. I think the reality today is that the sustainable investing market is it's in its infancy. There's too much greenwashing. There's a lot of sort of PR and CSR talk, but very little progress actually on true on backing companies that are truly sustainable in every sense of the word. And of course, SDGs embody that. The reality is that investors, I think, need to take a hard look at what constitutes a good company, what are the trade-offs between financial returns versus social returns, and to think of new ways of investing. It cannot help if we have an impact fund that follows a 2 and 20 model where someone tries to work like a normal commercially minded private equity fund. I think that we need to have a rethink about the way investors allocate capital to social enterprises. 
And similarly, I think governments can do their part by increasing allocations through their sovereign wealth funds and other means. I think uh, Nat mentioned startup grants. I think that's a very good thing. And I think some other people also have mentioned increased government allocations to infrastructure projects because the SDGs could never be met without more money going into it. So European sovereign wealth funds like the Norwegian fund and so on have greatly increased allocations toward green investments and SDG compliant investments. I think it's time to do the same in Asia. Asia benefits from having quite a bit of liquidity. Uh, and I think that it's very imperative for governments to make some of that liquidity available on the sustainability front, but not only for large enterprises, but also startup enterprises and truly sustainable enterprises. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Well, that, that's wonderful and very enriching as well. Thank you so much, Ravi. You know that in a normal Horasis meeting, when we're all in situ, we have an hour and a half per panel. Uh, we are cut back to 45 minutes, and that's clearly inadequate. So I am now going to, in the remaining time, uh, condense the final two questions and go around again. So I'm now going to ask you, uh, and this was already taken up earlier on by Michael, and that you both mentioned this, uh, What what is the role of private uh, public-private partnerships, and how, secondly, how to translate the SDGs into new business models. You've all hinted at this anyway, in your own ways. We're obviously looking at, 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 at an emergence, uh, at, at reset, at all kinds of innovations, spurred partly by COVID and partly by other things. So please, uh, back to Michael, but two minutes this time, and I, I must try to be the timekeeper. Um, what are your thoughts, uh, further thoughts, on the role of public-private partnerships and how to translate SDGs into new business models. Michael, please. Yeah, I, I think PPP, the public-private partnership, is a very important route to take to ensure that the SDGs can be implemented fully in many of the countries. So we need to be perhaps looking at uh, PFI, public finance initiatives, that some countries are already implementing, and I think this is something that can be developed further. I think there is also a need to align companies, CSR activities, with ESG, and ESG is now becoming more important, we need to also get companies to align the CSR with SDGs. And I think that can perhaps be one of the new business models that can, we can be pursuing and looking at the alignment of SDGs with ESG goals as well as with company CSR activities. I think uh, Jeff mentioned earlier the need to use big data for analysis and Again, I think companies can look at AI and, and, and the use of AI in, in uh, reviewing and, and looking at the vast amount of data that we have. And, and there is a need then for companies to really look at the business models as to how AI can become a major component of future business strategy. Mm. Thank you very much for that concise and informative perspective. I'm going to ask Nat the same questions. What's the role of PPPs, Nat, and how uh, do we translate the SDGs into new business models? Well, you're showing us how already, aren't you? But please give us your quick response. Uh, yeah, I, um, I just wanted to add a few things. Um, so very from the, from the beginning with my co-founder, who's, who's not here with me, unfortunately, tonight, um, is that we, from the very beginning, uh, we have, uh, you know, integrated the SDGs. If I, if I just show you our packaging, the, the happy to show, um, we, we are, you were talking about the, the, the four SDGs that we are contributing to. And we try, you know, by doing that to also educate, uh, the, the general population about SDGs. It's true that, uh, around me, uh, I, I'm, I'm surrounded by social entrepreneurs, so they know about SDGs, but, but you know, uh, my friends who are, who are not necessarily entrepreneurs um, or they related to SDGs have never, ever heard of it. So there's still a bit of marketing uh, that needs to be done in this area. What we try to do to through our small uh, startup, I would say for now, is that we really try to inspire other people, uh, especially the, the young generation, to, to find ways to contribute to the SDGs. Um, and we, for example, we donate 10% of our profits to protect endangered sea turtles, which are often victims of uh, plastic pollution. Uh, and this hopefully will, will inspire the youth uh, to, to do something. So, so I believe the, the startup's mission now is really to adapt to, to the trends, 
um, you know, focus on the main issues like plastic pollution and make it interesting for young generations. A very interesting uh, statistic that I have read recently about Vietnam, uh, because I didn't mention, but I'm Vietnamese from origin, um, is that 90% of Generation Z uh, is actually willing to contribute to, to a, a better society. And, 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 and Southeast Asia, which is beautiful about it, is, is very young. Um, yet, uh, and, and I think youth has now enough information, uh, to want to contribute to, to society. So as a startup, I want to inspire other youth and, you know, uh, hopefully contribute with, with government, uh, and the public sector as much as we can, uh, in the future months, uh, to be able to, to push forward our, our new technology and reduce hopefully the, the victims, uh, in the oceans and, and uh, the animals that suffer from it. So yeah, uh, hopefully this will inspire others to to create also, um, I would say, sustainable uh, non I mean startups in the future. Great, that's great. You are inspiring as you speak. I have no doubt. Jitesh, now this question that Michael raised about AI. I mean, you're the you're the right one to direct this to. We're talking now something beyond data driven platforms and technologies. But uh, what is your view of this and the role of? I'd be interested in, about your view of how AI yeah, is think, going to. Yeah, I think I think there are several areas right where really uh, innovative technology like AI, ML, uh, just, just using cloud computing at a very large scale can play a big role. Like taking like a broad stroke here, it's really difficult to get specific. Uh, but to address your question, right, uh, I think the public-private partnership is the key here. And let me take one example, the example around uh, supply chain transparency that manufacturing companies are really put on the spot all the time, right, all the time. Uh, and uh, and what's happening here to Ravi's point that policymakers need to put better regulation, actionable regulation in place uh, to address things like uh, supply chain transparency, for example. Right. But at the same time, uh, for big companies, manufacturing companies to really implement that, it's a very difficult thing. I've seen that it's it's really, really hard. Right. And so there, uh, what I have seen, uh, these big manufacturing companies, they partner with startups to really use innovative technologies uh, to be more transparent with their supply chain at a very low cost. And I think that's an example of a public private partnership right there. Right. You have a very specific piece of regulation, very actionable, very focused. And then you have these big manufacturing old school companies working with startups, making a bet, saying that, you know, we want to experiment with this, but we want to contain the cost, but we want also want to be innovative. I think it's a, it's a, it's a canonical example. If you go and look at it, what's happening with supply chain transparency, anybody will tell you that they want to be more transparent. If you talk to like a, a C-level guy in a manufacturing company, but when it comes to really implementing that, they will tell you, wow, this is really hard. Like, you know, how do we really do this? And uh, if you if they go to do that on their own, uh, it's it's really hard to do. Right. They this cost spiral out. So that's an example, an example where this is, I think, very, very important, that public private partnership. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Back to you, Sean. Could you please share your thoughts with us on, on these two questions? For me, uh, the, firstly, the public-private partnership, I mean, if I can provide a, an analogy, it's probably just one of, I think the publics provide the, the sporting field and the privates bring the equipment. If they're not in alignment, well, you don't know how you're playing the game. So it's about how you can predict your environment to play. So, and that determines how well, how wide, how big you want to be. That, well, that's the risk and the uncertainty, isn't it? And what game you're willing to play. So if there's an analogy there for me, it's that one. Uh, to answer your question in terms of, the SDGs and your business model. Um, again, it comes just through education. So, where do you see the threats and risk? But, but more so, where do you see the opportunities? So, uh, it's about you know, as I say, pivoting your business model for the future. Uh, if the future is um, including uh, sustainable finance, um, new products and services, transitioning from products into services, well, that comes through education. So. Uh, for me, it's, it's just continually learning. And that, and that, again, that education piece is coming through from what we mentioned before about being open, being collaborative, uh, working with um, 
with you know, maybe even potentially competitors. So it's a whole new sort of way of thinking, um, as I say, unthinking in terms of how you move forward. So I think that the whole notion of being a closed system these days, a total closed system, four walls in your business and, and trying to beat people just won't work. So the SDGs, if anything else, I think permit and play, give you a field up to being open. I think you win more, more ways by doing that. Well, all right. Thank you very much uh, for that insight. And uh, last, of course, and not least, Ravi, could you please share your thoughts with us on these, uh, the role of the PPPs and how to translate the SDGs into new business models? And uh, is this all going to require regulation and disclosure and, uh, and so forth? Or is there going to be some free play introduced into the, into the system? Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I think I gave some examples earlier. You know, a good example around the whole information regime and improving the information regime uh, is the partnership between the Family Business Network and the United Nations. Of course, it's kind of like a supranational, but still a good example of how it should work in terms of making sense of the SDGs and allowing companies to then have clear KPIs to work towards. Um, another good example, I think, is from the capital market side here in Singapore. The government of Singapore actually increased their allocation towards SDG funds by $2 billion dollars but they're doing that by dispersing the money to a number of private sector fund managers who already have green investment and you know sustainable investment strategies. So it's getting liquidity through the system, the example I talked about earlier. Um, but the third, Lou, to your point, I think more direct regulation is also required. You mentioned the single use plastics laws that have come into effect. I think governments will have to use carrot and stick uh, you know, in order to get more compliance. That's the reality. Uh, of course, the sticks we know, I think it will be fines, taxes, and so on. Uh, but there are a lot of carrots too, you know, so that's your free play sort of thing where companies that truly invest in making themselves more sustainable should be rewarded, should be rewarded with grants, qualification for certain government contracts, uh, access, preferential access to capital markets, uh, and so on. So, you know, I think that it, you, we need both. But uh, yeah, these are some ways where public private can work together. Indeed. And I mean, just you're making me think that we're also going to be incorporating more and more nanotechnologies and Internet of Things uh, and, and a lot of other ways of uh, perhaps in a more passive way doing important monitoring, uh, again, with both carrot and stick in mind. So I think I wonder what George Orwell will make of all of this when he's reincarnated. But in any case, it's really fascinating. Look, gentlemen, we've we've now got seven minutes left. We've sort of raced through a very complex agenda and you've been heroic uh, as well as informative and brief. Uh, in a normal harassus, we'd have now another 45 minutes in which to turn over to discussion with our participants. And unfortunately, we're all deprived of this opportunity because of the brevity of the session. We do have uh, one uh, volunteer named Rosa Gazizova who wants to share a story. I don't know if you're still in the room, Rosa, um, but you want to share a story about an innovative agrotech opportunity to meet SDG that has high prospects in Asia. That's certainly relevant to our discussion. May I ask whether you can do it in two minutes or less? And then I'll ask for a final response and takeaway from each of our panelists. Is that okay with you, Rosa? I'm going to give you the mic, but really try for one minute, but not more than two. Okay, it's it's all yours. Go ahead, Rosa. Okay, uh, thank you, Lou, very much, and uh, really happy to contribute to this uh, session. Um, I very much agree with what Ravi, Ravi just mentioned. I think that all the models that provide sustainability for the environment and for the business should be supported either by the government or, or international organizations. And I just wanted to share about one project, which I think is very crucial, especially for Asia. I am working at the moment with the inventors who have invented a very innovative technology of processing rice husk into the animal feed component. Why is this crucial? especially for the countries that are rice producing countries. This is crucial because rice, uh, like 20% uh, 
of paddy rice is rice husk. And rice husk does not decay in the ground. So the easiest and cheapest way for the farmers to get rid of it is just burn it or throw it into the rivers or oceans, thus creating a big pollution issues. So this technology helps to process rice husk in an env environmentally friendly way. And this also allows uh, animal feed producers to use less feed grains, either import them or produce them and buy them on the side. So uh, I just wanted to share this as one of the examples that really provide uh, sustainability for the environment as well as for the business because it is backed by the high economic uh, savings uh, for the business. And this technology okay, has you. been... Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry to cut you off. We, we are now on being tagged. Um, we have three minutes and 30 seconds left, so I'm going to turn back. Thank you again for the contribution. I'm going to invite our panelists now to give each a 30-second takeaway. Please, one minute, but now your words of wisdom condensed into 30 seconds. Any final thoughts for our viewers and for others? Please, Michael. Yes, I'd like to just emphasize two main SDGs that we need to prioritize. SDG 16, which is very important, building strong institutions and justice. I think in, in Southeast Asia in particular, we need to ensure that we have strong institutions. Without strong institutions, whatever plans we have may not work. Thank you. May not work. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. All right. Now over to Matt. Thoughts, please. Thank you uh, for... We haven't mentioned about the SDGs number 17, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the collaborative one. Uh, so I hope that, uh, you know, we can uh, maybe after this, uh, this call collaborate ourselves as a startup. We, you know, we will launch these new products that are edible and will replace uh, plastic, uh, single use plastic in the future, including forks and knives, which I believe is, uh, is really great because during the COVID, a lot of takeaways uh, has increased. So um, if any of you, I is interested to to know about uh, more about our products uh, to to help reduce plastic pollution in your area. Uh, please uh, help uh, contact me after the the event. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. And we'd like to know more about it in New York too. Thanks a lot, Nat. Jitesh, your thirty second takeaway, please. The last word from Silicon Valley. Driving uh, driving more uh, innovation through. Uh, public private uh, collaboration uh, and aided with really smart actionable regulation well thank you very much that was that was extremely brief and now you've saved a little more time for sean who's been extremely concise so sean please uh, give us your takeaway you you could now take 10 seconds uh, out of gtesh's time and give us <laughs> 40 second takeaway. Uh, thanks, Malik. Uh, look, I think in, in summary from my comments, and, and it, it hopefully it sort of summarizes what we've already discussed, is that there needs to be that beautiful balance between top down and bottom up approaches. We've mentioned regulation, policy, government intervention, collaboration, but that, that beautiful bottom up stuff where it's contextualized, um, it's local, local, I should say, we didn't. So the technology is deployed and solutions that are created are local, sustainable, and they, they meet, they, they they come with limited consequences. So if we get that beautiful balance between top uh, down and bottom up, I think we'll, we'll, do, we'll be doing okay. So Splendid. thanks very much. Thank you so much. Ravi, last word to you. What's your takeaway for us, please? Yeah, no, the SDGs as an aspirational goal is great for the planet, uh, but the hard work needs to be done in the next 10 years to achieve it. This means a better understanding of what SDGs are, uh, having regulation to back that up, and also having a reward system through the capital markets to reward those who actually make it. Thank you so much, lady and gentlemen. Um, our time is almost up. Ten seconds will be timed out. I just want to thank you for your energy and your wisdom in tackling a very large set of questions in a very digestible way. Well done and good day to you all. See you next you. time. Be well and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thanks.